Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you have been sitting in the back row and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all. That way you know every time I upload. If you also enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee. Or if you are interested in becoming a member of the channel, all that information can be found in the description below. Speaking of memberships, if you have purchased your elite membership, but it is wrong when the titles scroll, please send me a message so that I can fix it. With all of that out of the way, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your favorite, most popular genre of all, true Ouija stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Quick note, for those of you that do not like adult language, this video will not be for you, as the topic Ouija board has adult language all throughout. For everyone else, let's get into it. When I was in my senior year in high school, one of my friends had an old Ouija board that we would play with often. One night, we decided to play the Ouija board at the cemetery because we wanted to see what would happen. We believed in the paranormal to some extent, but we were also skeptical. We just wanted to have a good time and hopefully get spooked. We specifically liked this cemetery because it was the easiest to sneak into. Its fence was a very short wall that you could climb over. There were recently dug places for new burials that were going to happen. We played a couple times and spoke to some ghosts. Nothing really scary or weird. We asked them if they were alone, when they died, what's their name, etc. While playing, we started sensing this really awful smell. It was like rotting eggs and a dead animal. We looked around and we assumed it was just the holes that were being dug up. We eventually left because we got bored and the smell was disgusting. When we got in the car, we shook our shoes off and started to sanitize our hands. The smell suddenly appeared out of nowhere, really strong. It smelled like death. We kept putting hand sanitizer on our hands and when we would sniff them, it still smelled like death. After realizing that the smell would not leave our hands, we all got the sudden chill. We started screaming. We were screaming inside of my friend's car like girls from a high school horror movie. We finally calmed down and my friend turned the ignition and we bolted out of there. We eventually started laughing because the whole ordeal was pretty funny and we got what we wanted. But I will never forget that awful smell and how it would not leave us. Okay, this is my experience. It's a super long story that happened mainly over a week or so ago, with a prelude to the whole thing beginning a few months before everything crazy went down. So I apologize for the long read. It's worth it, though. My friends still often bring it up to this day. My hands and feet get clammy just talking about it. My first experience with the Ouija board was at a friend of... A friend's house. I was there with my best friend and her best friend at the time. My best friend, just call her Jessa, had grown up in this house which was notoriously haunted. The women who lived there would wake up with scratches on their backs. They would routinely see the ghost of a little boy. Crazy shit all the damn time. Anyway, Jessa's childhood friend moved in there when the family moved out. We were there for her housewarming party. Jessa's friend had a board. Jessa and I are both pretty spiritual, and neither of us wanted to touch it. Nothing was happening, so Chuck convinced us to do it, saying we were witchy. As soon as we touched it, the cursor started moving. At first, it was saying it was a little boy. Jessa and I looked at each other like, Oh, fuck. Both of us knowing 
about the little boy in the house. Suddenly, Chuck was like, oh, oh, man, did you guys feel that? Oh, we felt it. The air became thick, like hard to breathe. He described exactly what I felt. It was almost like the air was thick with fog or mist, but it was still dry. The board started spelling things like slut, fuck her, cheater, bitch, fuck you, he fucked her. The cursor was moving more rapidly with every word. Finally, Jessa was like, okay, stop. And the pointer stopped, dead in its tracks. It stopped too abruptly, then my hands slipped off. When I touched it again, it slowly dragged to the bottom of the board, ending in goodbye. Months later, I was crashing in a friend's place, K and J. They had a basement apartment and I was crashing their couch. The guys invited over some girls I didn't know and they wanted to try using a Ouija board. I did not want to touch it, but it wasn't working, so I finally gave in and decided to try it. As soon as I touched it, the pointer started to move. I was touching the pointer with my friend Kay. The cursor was moving really slowly. So as a game, I said, move faster. And it started moving quickly. I kept saying faster. And eventually it was moving blazingly fast. My friend touching the cursor was saying, uh, this isn't funny as if I was moving it. I said I wasn't moving it, and he freaked out, releasing the board and the pointer, went shooting across the room. At that point, we were all pretty convinced it was real. One of the girls wanted to see more, so we grabbed the cursor and started again. So, then the board asks to speak to a girl named Haley. The board says, family, father, and proceeds to spell her dad's name. She starts freaking out. The board says it's sorry about her dad, that her dad is a drug addict and her mom's a drunk. It says she has to leave her house because her dad is angry. Haley started crying and freaking out. The board says goodbye. We get back to the apartment and Haley is still crying. She tells us that her dad is a coke dealer and her mom is a drunk all the time. Her home life is awful. Her dad would frequently get drunk and coked up and hit her. She was only 16 or 17 at the time. K and J say she can stay at their place too. Interestingly, months later, Haley's mom dropped her off at the apartment complex and she told Haley that her great grandfather helped build the place. She said he lived there his whole life and died there. After that night, I started reading about Ouija boards. A couple nights later, I went to visit my best friend and her boyfriend at his place, which was walking distance to my apartment. I told them about the whole thing. He says he wants to try it too. Reluctantly, Jessa and I agree. Keeping in mind, we had all been drinking whiskey. Yes, I know this is altogether an awful idea. The cursor starts spelling out. Trees. Broken glass. Suddenly, it starts getting violent, spelling out, R Fuck her teeth! Jessa and I tell it to stop, and we say goodbye. The curse drags to goodbye, and we put the board away. Suddenly, Chuck is like, Oh shit, dude. You're not walking home. He then explains his interpretation of what the board was saying. On my way to my friend's place, like I said, they lived in a basement apartment, so instead of walking through the halls, we'd just go to the living room window and climb in. To get to the window, I would cut through a back clearing where there were tall trees all over. He's convinced that there are bad guys in there on that night, and that if I walked home, I would get raped, hence the fucker teeth shit. Needless to say, after that visual, I stayed over. The next morning, when I walked through the clearing, there were broken glass bottles all over the place, and my friend said they had heard people drinking out there all night. Anyway, I moved out, and Haley and I became friends. Kay brought the board over as a housewarming gift. 
One day, my cousin came over to my apartment with her boyfriend at the time. Her boyfriend notices the board in the corner. He asks me about it, and I laugh and tell him the whole story. His eyes get all wide, and he asks if we can play with it. Being kind of stoned, I agree, and we start asking it questions. The pointer starts spelling Jess's name. We all get in the car and head over to her place. She's not home, but Chuck is. I left the board in the car with my cousin and her boyfriend and go talk to Chuck. She said Jessa was at work until 9 that night, but we could come in and wait for her. After the last incident, he was interested to see what would happen. When I got to the car, my cousin and my boyfriend said they heard fingers tapping, as if something we were waiting impatiently for me to get back. We sat around waiting for a while, and Chuck brings out his own board from the last time I was over. We used it, and it says, Jessa, Jessa, and pointing to the no, then to the sun in the upper of the board over and over no sun no sun eventually i figured that it was saying no light i asked if it wanted me to turn off the light and i said uh no we're not going to do that i had read that bad spirits do not like the light finally when jessa got home she said she was too tired and didn't want to try using it we agreed to leave it alone and brought the board game. I didn't like having it in my house, so the next time I went to visit Haley at K and J's place, I brought it back. She said she wanted to try it one more time, and then we would get rid of it. I agreed. At this point, I was clearly addicted to it for some reason. So, Haley and I are at the basement apartment, climbing out the windows for cigarettes next to the back clearing with the trees. We go back in and use the board. The board starts spelling out Haley's name, and this time the spirit says its name is Maria. Haley immediately starts to cry and says, That's not funny. I had no idea why or what was going on, but the board keeps things. It's saying, Tell them I miss them. Tell them I love them. I'm here. I love them. As Haley is crying, she explains that her best friend's mom, Maria, died a year ago. I remember the death. It was big news in our high school. Suddenly, the cursor moved and spelled my name. I asked who it was, and the cursor spelled D-E-B, Deb. I read that bad spirits cannot tell their names because they won't have one. If a spirit can spell a name, that means it's usually a good one. I ask how I know her, and she says she's my spirit guide. Haley says, how do we know you're real? And the cursor spells, cigarette. And I said, what do you mean? And it replied, window. We looked at each other, and our hearts sink. I'm like, she knows we smoke outside. I said, how will we know? And she said, trees. I quickly say, fuck that. And Haley says, we have to continue to do it. So we're smoking outside. I'm looking into the forest, sweating balls in fear, thinking I'm going to see a fucking demon face in the branches or something. Eventually, we relax. And then Haley, mid-sentence, her face drops and goes white, and she's like, Oh, fuck, 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 get inside now! I fucking tossed my cigarette and jumped in the window. We closed the blinds and were breathing super heavy. I'm like, What the fuck is happening? She says that behind me, in the distance, there was a big-ass, like, 100-foot-tall tree. There was no wind. I remember this because I was watching my cigarette smoke go directly up and I was blowing perfect O's without them disappearing. She says the tree was still then suddenly the whole tree including the trunk moved back and forth then went back to perfectly still. I was like oh hell no. 
and after a while of freaking out, sat back at the board. We both put our fingers on it. It said, Did you see? We fucking freaked out. It was spelling. It's okay. I love you. It's okay. Don't be scared. Finally, it asked to speak to only me and for Haley to go away. Haley jokingly said, Aw, you don't like me? And the board said, Don't be sad. This story closes pretty weak because in my mind, nothing really came of it. When I tried to use the board on my own, nothing happened. I couldn't move it without the help of Haley and my spirit guide. Couldn't communicate with me. I like to think it was real and my spirit guide, Deb, was just trying to get me off the board. As I said, we had been talking about it a lot and were using it quite a bit. I sometimes wonder what Deb wanted to tell me. Anyways, that's it. I haven't touched one to this day, but I do have a slight obsession with making Ouija boards as art. A little bit of background before I get started. This actually all happened at my friend Mackenzie's house, which she had lived in only for about one to two years at the point of this event. I don't know when, but I came over her house to use the Ouija board before anything really crazy happened. We set up candles and turned off all the lights. I even read somewhere online that you can use a silver coin to keep a spirit from sneaking through. So, I pulled one out and put it on the board. Literally, nothing happened, and we got bored. So, we went into the garage and listened to Edgar Allan Poe poetry, because it was scarier. Although nothing happened, I felt like I'd mentioned us doing this, so all of you can scold me in the comments for being stupid and using a Ouija. Just don't get your hopes up, because... We continued to do dumb shit throughout this whole experience. And I thought I'd mention it because this is when we got the name of the ghost. Mackenzie's stepsister, who was also named Mackenzie, said something about talking to Tituba, the first woman accused of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials. Me and my friend are dumb and had no clue who Tituba was. So, when weird shit started happening, we just started calling it Tatuba. If the spirit of the real Tatuba is reading this, I am so sorry. Now, on to the actual experience. This happened on February 5th in 2016. Me and Kenzie were hanging out and decided we wanted to take some Polaroid pictures in the background. The sun was setting to the point where it was dimmed out but we could still see everything. Mackenzie was standing at the top of the stairs to the dock, while I stood on the lower part and posed for the picture, looking away from her. As I was standing, I heard something running down the stairs saying, I don't know what that is, over and over and over. If I'm being completely honest, I thought she saw a bug, which scared the shit out of me because I'm terrified of insects. We both ran out to the very end of the dock, and I asked her what she saw. She said, as she was going to take a picture of me, she heard rustling behind her in the bushes. When she turned around, she saw a tail, almost a blacked-out figure, creeping out from the bushes. After hearing that I was afraid of a home intruder or something, and we were both too scared to walk back, which leads to stupid things we did. Number two, because we were so freaked out, we waited too long and the sun eventually set all the way. I had a shitty Android phone, so I had to download a flashlight app, and we ran back into our house in practically pitch black. Before we started running, Mackenzie snapped a photo of her camera. There's nothing in it. The blur is her finger. But I might still add it. I had to go home that night, but I made sure to come back the next day. When it was the next day, I came back as soon as I could to investigate. 
I took my videos, but unfortunately didn't catch any of the crazier stuff on camera. Mackenzie's cousin was at the house with us, and we all went back out to the top deck to check out the scene. While we were out there, Kenzie's cousin's phone died at like 30% and wouldn't turn back on. We didn't really think about that too hard, but when we went back inside, Mackenzie's phone began to glitch as well. Every time she typed her password in it, it rejected it, and I can vouch for her because I know her password. Her Siri started going off and saying random shit, and eventually her phone just straight up died as well. Kenzie's computer was on, and sorry, this requires some explaining. If you've never used Google Hangouts, when you're in a chat, you can see when someone else is online. And when they are typing and in the chat, it clearly showed that Kenzie's cousin was online and typing. Despite her dead phone being the only electronics she could access Hangouts on. After a while of nothing happening, we were watching all the videos I had taken on my iPad. And we were joking about Tatuba. Dumb thing number three, we all start antagonizing Tatuba and making fun of it, calling it like a stupid motherfucker, that sort of thing. And man, I can't make this shit up. Mackenzie's dead phone from across the room in her Siri voice said, Now, now. Like it, she was scolding us. Before you say anything, I know that phrase is just programmed into the Siri, but none of us had touched that phone in like 30 minutes and it was completely dead from what we could tell needless to say we all practically shit ourselves and ran out the door screaming now this is where it gets even weirder because we were so freaked out by what happened in the room we decided to take a walk around the neighborhood to calm down since my sister was the oldest in our friend group Kenzie wanted to call her because of what had happened. When my sister answered the phone, Kenzie specifically said the words, I'm sorry to call you. I'm just too scared to be in my house right now. Literally, like a week earlier, my sister had a dream in which Kenzie called her on the phone and said that exact phrase verbatim. In the dream, a group of people had killed and eaten her pet cat, Kahuna who unfortunately was killed by dogs shortly after this. That wasn't the last time my sister predicted cats dying in her dreams, but that's a whole other subject to talk on a whole nother day. After we told her what had happened in the dream, Kenzie freaked out and we ran back to the house to take all of the animals out so nothing bad happened to them. Her mom arrived home as we were all huddling out in the front yard with our cat and pit bull. And she yelled at us, of course. After that, nothing happened for the rest of the day. But odd things would still occasionally happen at her house. I've heard footsteps in her attic. And they actually had a pest control person check up there because of the noises. And there was no proof of anything being up there. I wasn't there for this, but, but one night, Kenzie was watching Rick and Morty in her living room, and a laundry basket just slid across the floor right in front of her. Thankfully, the activity has pretty much disappeared, and nothing that odd has happened in a while, other than a spider bed. But again, that's another story. I apologize for the link, but I wanted to make sure I got all of the details I could remember in the story. I think this is one of the only experiences I've had when I legit can only interpret it as paranormal. Too much weird shit has happened at that house, and the fact my sister predicted a conversation she had on the phone with Kenzie's just icing on the cake. If any of you have any similar experiences or have been through what I've been through, please share your story.
strange things have been happening in our little two-bed flat, and we were hoping to gain perhaps some insight or maybe a different perspective on our experiences. So, for starters, I'm a practicing pagan and have been most of my life. I am no stranger to the paranormal. I regularly sage our home or bless it with burning incense. We frequently have windows open, allowing a through breeze to whisk away any negative energy. I have a lot of experience with Ouija board and seances. What I'm trying to say is, I'm not new to this kind of thing, but I'll be damned if it's not freaking me out. I moved into the flat December 14th of 2018. When we came to view the flat, I immediately felt a positive energy. It was like I belonged here with my little one. The energy remained positive for the longest time, and little things happened. For example, I'd put my phone down in the living room, popped in to check on my daughter, came back, and my phone would be nowhere to be found. I would spend the next 10 to 15 minutes searching for it everywhere to no avail. Then I'd go back to where I had left it, and you guessed it, there it would be. Now, of course, this could be put down to simple absent-mindedness on my part, but after it happened, not only to me, but also to my fiancé and friends who regularly visit, I'm inclined to believe it's something a bit more. I own a Ouija board, just a cheap little thing. I store the board in my living room, currently on the bookshelf, and the planchette in the kitchen with my other witchy bits. It was frequently fall off the bookshelf or the fireplace or the TV shelf, regardless of how it was placed, and for this I had no logical explanation. One night after my fiancé had moved in, our daughter was at her dad's for the weekend and my mom was over for dinner and we did a seance. My mom and I conducted and participated in many seances over the years. So we're not just kids messing about. I cannot stress this enough. We were slow to start. The energy was low, but we soon had something come through. But it was sluggish and easily confused. It was finally able to tell us that it was not alone and that something was stopping it from communicating with us. Whatever was stopping it came through stronger and started asking us to lend it our souls. Uh, nope. After a while, without much more contact, we closed the seance and I saged the shit out of our flat just to be safe. And at first it seemed to have worked, until a couple of weeks later when lockdown started. Our little girl frequently goes to bed with us. She's three years old and we co-slept until we moved in here when she was nearly two. We have times when she spends most of the night in her own bed, but since the lockdown started, she wakes up two to three times a night and gets into bed with us. Her room is right next door. There is a light from the bathroom, so it's not too dark, and she has never had a problem walking from her room to ours, often without us even realizing she got into bed with us. The bedroom doors do not slam. The carpet is too thick at the bottom, and they're fire doors, with a chain that causes them to close slowly. We have tried to slam the door to our bedroom. It doesn't slam. This is important. Another important tidbit. My fiancé sleeps like the dead. She never wakes up to our daughter at night. But a couple of weeks ago into lockdown, my fiancé woke up to our daughter crying and what sounded like a little person's footsteps on the laminate flooring in the hallway, but wasn't fully awake until our bedroom door slammed. She got out of bed to see where Little had gone, and she was in her room, as far away from the bedroom door as she could possibly be. When Little saw my fiancé, she shouted that she wanted mummy, and ran right past her and straight into our room, into bed with me. She has no history of sleepwalking. The next morning, we talked about what had happened. I had, very uncharacteristically, slept through the whole thing, up to little getting into bed with me. It's important to note 
that I have always done every night, wake up. I wasn't especially tired. There is no reason for me not to have woken up like normal, and yet I slept through it. We came to the conclusion that, firstly, the door should not have slammed, particularly if Little had pushed it open, slightly, to come and get into bed with us. Secondly, why did she run out of the room instead of just getting into bed with us as normal? And thirdly, why was she cowering in the corner of her bedroom? Another important tidbit, our daughter and my fiancé have a wonderful relationship and has zero reason to fear either of us. She has never reprimanded for getting into bed with us or waking us up. Very creepy shit, and it gets spookier. Later that day, we were all sitting in the living room, and our daughter's phone, used for Paw Patrol and kid puzzles, that was on the fireplace, fell rather violently, without any rhyme or reason. We were all sitting down. Daughter wasn't jumping about. Our neighbors weren't banging on the wall. There is no reason for her phone to have fallen. There have been times when the living room door, which stays open when pushed all the way, has randomly slammed with no breeze or anything that might have caused it to close. And then tonight, Little woke up. I went to soothe her back to sleep. She had kicked her covers off, so I pulled them back onto her bed. Then she woke up again talking about a monster under her bed and asking me if she was safe in her bed. She has a mid-sleeper, so there's space under her bed, but she has never worried about monsters being under there. Just wanted to share my story and maybe gain some outside perspective onto it. Now, after writing this out, I'm going to go sage the shit out of our house. I had just come home from my first summer of my freshman year in college. My parents were in the process of their divorce and both decided to vacate the house and leave me alone. I was angry, confused, and I felt abandoned by both of my parents and refused to talk to either one of them. I hated being in the house alone. I never liked being there alone, even when my parents were still together. Eventually, the foreclosure note appeared on the front door. My parents gave up on the house, and I felt like they gave up on me. With the short notice, I knew I wasn't going to have the money, so I decided on getting an apartment with my friends. There was about a two- to three-week waiting list, so we just stayed in the house leading up to moving into the apartment. They knew about some of my experiences in the house and had witnessed many things, just for the short amount of time they stayed with me. Do not ever play with Ouija boards. That's what everyone always says. We didn't have the real thing, so we made one from a piece of cardboard and a little whiskey glass as the planchette. This was all a joke to them. They were just asking random questions and getting random responses. Nothing too scary or serious. They were laughing and making fun of the entire situation. I felt uneasy the entire time. I knew what the house was capable of, and for some odd reason, I knew it was holding back. They got bored easily and eventually stopped playing. I was somewhat relieved. We were sitting around in the kitchen when we heard scraping on something coming from the living room. When we went to investigate, we saw the glass moving around the board by itself, fairly fast. It was landing on different letters, but in a weird, repetitive way. I can still hear the sound in my head. This was clearly terrifying and wasn't what or who we were previously making contact with. We grabbed the piece of paper and spilled out the words it was making. There are seven. At this point, most people would walk away, but we were all too intrigued. The house was starting to show its true nature. We positioned ourselves around the board and placed our fingers on the glass. I asked, who or what is the seven? It spelled out, B-A-D, and then spelled out, 
D E M O N S. I then asked who or what we were speaking to, and it spelled G A R Y. My friends did not know this at the time, but I knew Gary. He also knew that when he passed away, that he had requested his ashes be spread into our woods because he had always loved to hunt and hike in them. This was done in a small private ceremony, and the only thing marking where it was done was a small concrete deer statue placed by a tree deep into the woods. My emotions were all over the place, and in that moment, I felt as if Gary were speaking to us. The energy was insane, but there was a calmness in that moment. I had tears beginning to form when I asked Gary several more questions. In the course of these questions, we were able to determine that seven demons inhabited the land, inside the house, and on the porch. We also learned that there were bad and good spirits, and that the bad trumped the good in numbers but the good were stronger and kept me safe throughout my life. During this time, the board kind of switched gears, and we also made contact with a man named Heshman. He only gave us his last name. Heshman was a popular name in our town, and several Heshmans actually lived in the area. He had said he died in a car accident and gave us the cemetery, which was in the town that he was also buried in. He was apparently one of the good spirits that helped keep the bad spirits away. I was in disbelief and very intrigued. I was getting answers that I had been searching for since I was a child. However, one of my friends wanted more. He so desperately wanted to speak with the bad spirits and began taunting whatever or whoever was there. I urged him to not because I knew what the house was capable of. I even took my fingers off the glass because I didn't want my energy to mingle with whatever he was trying to contact. He told Gary and Heshman goodbye and said he wanted to talk to one of the bad, evil spirits. Clearly not the smartest guy. He kept demanding a name with no response. Even after everything... He had just witnessed he wanted more proof. He had a cigarette and dared one of the spirits to roll it off the board. If the spirit did, he would give them a lighter to smoke it. Again, just taunting the house to show him more proof. But it happened. Not only did the cigarette roll off the board and onto the carpet, it rolled back onto the board. This means it had to roll up over the lump separating the board from the carpet. We all immediately jumped back. Everyone's fingers came off the glass, and the energy in the house became thick. The house was alive. The lights began to flicker. The sinks began to spit water full blast. The ceiling fan cords began to swing in circles. You could hear something stomping around on the porch. Whispers were coming from every corner of the house in the basement. Doors started to slam, and the famous shadow figures from the catwalk and the basement were back. No matter how many times we apologized, it would not stop. My house had five doors, one on each side and one leading out of the basement. We ran to the front door, and it didn't open. It wouldn't open. Something was holding it closed, and I do mean firmly. The only door we were able to get out of was one of the side doors, but it slammed behind us, nearly knocking my friend to the ground. Once we were outside, we would hear something running up on us on the porch. We all dove off the side stairs and into the grass. Whatever was on the porch kept running beside us while we were running to our car in the grass. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. When we jumped into the car and started up the driveway, something hit the back window so hard that I could see a hand imprint on the glass. We stayed at a friend's house that night, but I didn't think either one of us actually slept. The events of that night was truly traumatizing. Reliving now 
My heart is pumping so hard because I remember the feeling all the time. We had to go back to the house eventually, and it was a day we all dreaded. The doors were locked. We didn't lock those. But the inside was totally trashed. There was stuff everywhere. However, the Ouija board didn't look like it had ever moved. It was in the same spot we left it, with a single cigarette laying in the middle of the board. The only thing that was different is the whiskey glass appeared to be on top of the number seven. We quickly grabbed all of our essential items that we needed for the apartment and left the bigger items for later. I would like to say that we never experienced anything again, and we were all convinced there was a lot of residual activity. The apartment we moved into was a somewhat new complex, and there would be a lot of odd things that would happen. I first started experiencing sleep paralysis around that time, and I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night to a dark figure standing in my doorway. From that point on, I never felt alone. I have never gone back to that house after I moved my stuff out. I know it foreclosed, and I believe it was sold during an auction. I have no idea who the new occupants are. They were apparently not from the area. However, I still feel such a strong connection to that house. When I visit my hometown, I feel a strange urge just to go to it, just to drive past it, but I never do. It haunts my dreams often, and I am constantly reminded of it and of the ghosts that are associated with it. I tried to contact paranormal entities, and some not-so-fun things happened. So, this is the time my friends and I decided to be extra stupid, and I say this because I want all who hears this to understand that I, as well as my friends, now fully understand how dumb we were being. The important backstory for this is the location, Proctor Valley. Proctor Valley is in San Diego County and connects to the towns of Ote and Jamul. It is a protected wildlife area, so no houses, no businesses, no buildings. It is situated behind a prominent mountain with hilly ridges boxing in the valley. It is said that this valley is a center for the unexplained. Stories range from light in the sky, ghost cars, ladies in white, random screams, the usual stories that surround almost every isolated dirt road. The place is surrounded with rumors. It is, however, in actuality, a dangerous place. Being situated closely to the U.S. and Mexican border, it is a frequently used pathway for drug smuggling and being in its isolated dirt road on the outskirts of a major city. Other, um, things tend to go down there, if you know what I mean. You have your usual terrible things like rape, carjackings, murders, Lots of bad things, but one murder stands out. The apparent poisoning of a teenage girl in a blue floral dress, never identified, found barefoot on the side of the dirt road. Okay, now to my experience. I had driven down the road late at night several times with friends for fun. The place has very few trees, let alone any large ones, but... About midway down the road, there is a very large tree hanging halfway over the road. This tree has always given me a bad feeling, so I never feel comfortable stopping there to explore. However, this night I was determined. I once and for all had to know if this place had something weird going on. I wanted my own experience, and I wanted it badly. I had dug up my family's old Ouija board and studied for weeks on the proper use of the board. How to get the results you want, the whole shebang. We 
purchased the correct candles, I think, and found the most pure salt we could find, and we drove out to the road. This ended up being a bit of an event, as about ten people showed up. Four of us used the Ouija board, two filmed, and four sat in lawn chairs. Once we all got ready, we began. I, being dumb and unoriginal, figured we should go straight to demon land and try to anger a demon and contact it. Which demon? Pazuzu. Again, I was dumb and unoriginal. Well, after we initially started, we heard what sounded like orchestral music being played. Being on a road, we figured it was another car driving down in the distance and would wait for it to pass to continue because it would be a bit awkward if someone drove by and saw a bunch of people summoning demons. We waited 25 minutes and no car, no headlights, no noise besides the music. A bit confused, some scared, we continued. The planchette was moving, but based on the answers, someone had to be moving it. So, when a random twig snapped and everyone jumped out of fear, I just placed my fingers on the planchette. One person, the person moving the planchette, got too scared and opted out. So, I and two others braved on. I did my best to anger whatever could be out there, and to my surprise, we got a response. There was no music being played, and the piece was moving. I asked, Is anyone or anything here with us that would wish to communicate? And the piece moved to, yes, in a very slow, smooth way that honestly felt terrifying. It felt like it was being dragged across the board. Not like someone was pushing or sliding it. With the confirmation of something wishing to speak, I moved to the next question. Are you Pazuzu? Same feeling as the planchette moves. No. My heart sank. I was thinking, okay, well, I got something biting. Let's see what it is. I see everything is fixed on the board. Eyes locked in. I ask probably the next logical question most people would ask. Are you a good spirit? Then the two phones that were being used to film the event turn off. They then went and turned back on, and the planchette began to move. It slides over to the letter G, and we all let out a big, whew. Everyone was relieved it was going to spell good. It then, unsurprisingly, moves to O. More confirmation to us it's spelling good. But then it stopped. Nothing. No movement at all for over five minutes. It was telling us to leave. I ask, do you want us to go? And as I finish the question, my friend drops to her knees and she is screaming and crying. I move the planchette to goodbye, and I say it, and I rush to her and ask what happened. She said someone was walking over to us and pointed down the road. I looked down, and all I saw was a cloud of dust rolling off the road about 15 feet away. This was the most honest person I had ever known, and decided right then we were leaving. She described the person walking towards us as having very dark hair, long limbs, but no distinguishing face features. They walked like a video game character glitching, where their stride definitely did not match the pace at which they were moving, and their feet never seemingly touched the ground. When she looked at it, she said she felt every emotion she has ever felt come over her. She equated it to the feeling of your family dying while you win the lottery on your wedding day. This was almost two years ago. All of my friends still refused to go out at night. I tried a year ago, and she just cried in the car the whole time saying he's getting closer. Yes, she has been going to therapy for this specific incident.
I don't know what she saw that night, but I personally didn't want to find out. I have not returned to that road since. I hide the board away, and it went missing six days later to the day, along with the candles and books. If you made it this far into my story, thank you, because this is a true story. I really wished it wasn't. I honestly don't know what happened that night. I don't really want to know, but there is something there. I'm currently searching for any footage of that night. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. I would like to take a moment and give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klemko, Anita V, Doba Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so very much for keeping Back to Ashes the way it is. I'm just the guy behind the mic. (laughs) But anyway, thank you for your support. I really, really, really do appreciate each and every one of you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed the selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.